On today's Locked On Giants podcast, the Athletics Nick Baumgartner gives us another perspective on the Giants draft and free agency approach. That's coming your way next on the Locked On Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked On Giants podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trena. And I am a credentialed member of the New York Giants media for Locked On, as well as for Giants Country over on the Fan Nation Network. Special welcome in to my Blue Crew community members, my everydayers, my newcomers, and everybody in between. You are all appreciated and loved by yours truly. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Or if you watch on YouTube, your first watch of the day. And on today's Locked On Giants podcast, I'm pleased to welcome in Nick Baumgarter. Gardner, he is with the uh, the Athletic. He is a senior writer, NFL draft analyst, and you know this time of year, lots of draft wins, lots of draft no. rumors, lots of draft speculation, and Nick is going to help us sort out some of what he's observed, what he's heard, and so forth. Nick, thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you, Patricia. Glad to be here. Nick, let's start off, you know, we're coming off of the combine and obviously all eyes are on the quarterbacks. You know, there's been talk that J.J. McCarthy of Michigan helped his stock tremendously, um, maybe worked himself up into the top six discussion. You know, previously, I don't think he had been there. What have you heard? What have you observed? And is McCarthy, has he actually moved up? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that um, I wouldn't say that he's moved up, but I think that NFL teams have caught up is what I would say, because I think when we really went back in December uh, and what we tried to do in the draft world is stay ahead of the NFL teams, right? They're not really going to get into too much from a coaching standpoint. You know, the GMs might drop in, but they're not going to get too much breakdown until like after the Super Bowl, after the season ends. So when the college season ended, a lot of us sort of thought like J.J. McCarthy is a first round quarterback. And given the needs of so many teams in this draft needing a quarterback, it's going to push everybody up. Same thing with Jaden Daniels. In another year, these guys might not be, you know, thought of this highly. But I think what's happened is is so many teams have convinced themselves, okay, we need a quarterback. We can't wait. This is not a thing where we can kick the can down the road because there's enough talent this year uh, in that there's four guys who could conceivably say maybe five who would be first-round quarterbacks. So I think that's what's pushed everybody up. And like you said, J.J. McCarthy goes to the combine. And unlike Jaden Daniels, he tests, he throws uh, through well. Uh, weighed in heavier than I think people expected. I think he interviewed well as well. So, yeah, I don't think he did anything to hurt himself. And right now, this time of year, that's all you're trying to do is not hurt yourself, right? So um, I think that those four quarterbacks, uh, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, uh, all of them could go in the top 10. Uh, certainly all of them could go in the top six, depending on who wants to, if somebody wants to move up. But I, uh, I'm not sure if that'll happen because there's also some really good receivers up there too. Nick, you know, there's been some concern that McCarthy at Michigan didn't throw the ball as much as Jaden Daniels and some of the other quarterbacks in this draft class. You know, there's some questions as to why. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is and do you think that that's hurting him? So I think that it's really a case of the place that he played college football. He played for a coach in Jim Harbaugh uh, that's all about the run game. And obviously the team that that he had at Michigan was uh, all about the run game. They won the uh, Joe Moore Award, I believe, two of the last three years, which goes to the top offensive line. That was the program that McCarthy chose to attend. And I think he did it for a reason in that they run a pro style offense that's run heavy. They don't ask him to do a whole lot with, with his arm. But then again, they were never going to ask any quarterback to do anything with (laughs) with more than the average with their arm. What they do ask of him though, is I would say is what I tell people, there's probably three to five throws per game that he makes that are translatable throws to the NFL. If you cut up, 40 Bo Nix throws, there might be 10 that are really translatable to the NFL, right? So it's really not as high sometimes as we think when we think of those down the middle of the field, the really difficult throws. When McCarthy was asked to do those things at Michigan, he normally hit them. Uh, the, and we saw that at the combine with the deep shots over the top and the accuracy there. But most important, I think, for him is 
He athleticism out of the pocket. He can get out of a get out of the pocket against the rush, keep his eyes up, and still look to make a play down the field with his arm. Uh, he's got a lot of that off-platform stuff that Mahomes has uh, and a lot of really good agility. So I think he's a really unique player, and I think that you have to really dive in deep to why he was and wasn't used and sort of what he could be asked to do in a different offense in the NFL. I think because he wasn't asked to do something, that isn't necessarily uh, indicative of that he can't do something, I think, in this case. When you look at, you know, his skill set as well as, you know, the other quarterbacks, you know, it, obviously the Giants – it's believed that the Giants are going to dip into this quarterback class. It's a historically deep quarterback class. Mm -hmm. Do you think the best option for the Giants, if they do go draft, is to go in that first cluster, that McCarthy, that Daniels, Williams, um, May group? Or is there another quarterback that maybe can be had on day two that can develop into a bona fide starter? Yeah, if I were New York, I think I would wait. I think because, there, like you said, there are guys – uh, in, in day two, really at the top of day two, and maybe even the middle of, you know, Bo Nix is kind of the fifth guy in this conversation that, you know, maybe a team decides in the late first round, they want to jump up and get Bo Nix ahead of the, the second round wave. And maybe that would be a case where if you're New York and you say, hey, we, we're, we're going to address a, a bigger need elsewhere because we just paid Daniel Jones and we're not going to totally immediately just, you know, get another guy in here right behind him. We're going to show him a little bit of faith, maybe get him a receiver, maybe get him a lineman. But maybe in the second or third round, because I think, you know, Joe Schoen even said at the combine, they're going to draft a quarterback and they're probably going to sign one too. So I think if you waited, a guy like Bo Nix, a guy like Michael Penix, or even, um, you know, the Tulane quarterback there, uh, Pratt, Michael Pratt, um, those are guys that all I think can be groomed into starters and guys that could maybe even start a game right away this year if you needed them to. But most important, they're guys that could conceivably come in and I think push Daniel Jones in a way that he needs to be pushed. Because he does need to be pushed. I don't think that the Giants need to be giving up on him right now, but he needs to be pushed. He can't just sit there comfortably with a backup that's no conceivable threat to his job. I don't think that's good for him as a young player. So I think if I was New York, I would wait till maybe uh, second or third round. But like you said, I would definitely address it. I don't think I would. I don't think I would skip this quarterback class because it is a really good one, and next year's isn't nearly as good. Right, right. Now, you know, you brought up Daniel Jones, who continues to divide the Giants fan base. Yeah. There are those that support him. There are those that want him gone yesterday. Yeah. He was six. He played six games into this new contract that he signed. Um, obviously, injury injuries, not his fault. Right. But there were some questions about whether he regressed. You know, the slow processing time continues to be an issue with him. Some of the decision making. He never really looked comfortable um, and some people will say, well, you know, his offensive line got hurt. Saquon Barkley got hurt and whatnot. But objectively speaking, Nick, when you look at Daniel Jones, did he take a step back? Or is this basically what we've been seeing from him the last, you know, four or five years that he's been in the league? I think if nothing else, he stayed the same, which sort of defaults at, yeah, step back. I don't, it certainly wasn't a step forward, right? It's not, he's not a better player today than what we thought of when before last year started. Certainly not. So I think in that sense, yes, he probably did take a step back because time is, you don't get that time back regardless of injury. But I do think, and I, like we just said, he needs to be pushed. You know, I thought last year when he went into that year, I was um, actually in Detroit when the Giants came for uh, practices. And I remember seeing him that that week. And the first day he was really all over the place. Second day he was really good. The third day kind of all over, you know, it was really sort of inconsistent. And to me it was, this is a guy that still needs to be pushed. He still needs to be have somebody behind him that is really nipping at his heels because he hasn't really done anything yet in a league to prove that sort of status. I just think he's in a spot where you've got to find ways to keep him confident. And I think they addressed that at the combine. They said, said that I should say at the combine, they got asked so many times uh, shown did anyway, I should say about quarterbacks. And finally, he just kind of said like, if you don't have a team around them, it's not really going to matter. I think you can point to the Chicago bears, what they're going for with Justin Fields in the best, in the, in the best example of that. And the giants, absolutely need help on the offensive line. Uh, it's not his fault that the, the line has been so bad for so long. They need help at receiver. Um, they need help pretty much all over the place in a lot of areas, especially on defense as well. So um, I do think that there's a case to be made right now in, you know, there's a lot more to be done before there's panic about Daniel Jones, I think, to be setting in. They just signed that deal. I think they're in a place to where last year they won more games. I think people probably thought they were going to. I should say Dable's first year. This year was maybe more of a regression back to normal. And I think maybe we'll ride it out here with Daniel Jones and see what happens this year. Hey, Giant fans, passion, drive, and patience. 
What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay's guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. So if you're the Giants, you know, you're kind of at a crossroads because how much longer can you realistically right. say, you know, Daniel Jones, we're going to give him another shot. We're going to do this. We're, you know, it, it just seems like there's a lot of excuses being made for him. And some of them are valid, as you pointed out. You know, guys got to have protection in order to function. But some of them, you know, obviously are, are the fact that he hasn't developed. So right. if you're the Giants, at what point do you just say, all right, that's it. You know, we've done everything we can. Time to move on. Yeah, that's why I think this year you've really got to address a younger quarterback. In addition to, I think they also want to sign a veteran guy uh, as well in some capacity. But I, they, I do think they have to address the younger end of the roster there, or the younger end of the position pool, I should say. Because like you said, if Daniel Jones goes to the year and has a bad season, let's say, and just really, we're not even talking about, is this a step back? It's an obvious step back. But you're two years into that contract, and without knowing every detail of all the money, you're probably at a situation where you're at least – like we need to give somebody else a look here or at least, you know, have a chance to maybe give somebody else a look, which is why I think if you address it now, then you have a guy, even if he doesn't do anything this year, even if you take Bo Nix or Michael Penix or Pratt or Spencer Rattler, and they just sit there and do nothing behind Daniel Jones, who's struggling while other guys are maybe coming up around him, you know, then at least you've got that guy who's there to maybe push him going forward. If it's financially not feasible to get out of the deal. I think that right now they're still so early in the contract that, they can't totally panic or worry about what if he fails. They still have to give him one more shot, I feel like, before they can get to that point. But this is the NFL. It's not for long, right? I mean, right when you decide, and it'll be this year, I think by the end of the season, you'll know one way or the other if he's going to be the guy. Um, that's why it's a big season for him. you got to be honest with yourself and all that, but you do have to give him, I think, one more shot here. Right, and of course, they have the escape hatch in his contract if they decide he isn't the guy moving forward. All right, now, Nick, I want to pivot just real quickly to the wide receiver group because that's the position I think the mm -hmm. Giants go in round one. I don't know if you agree or not, but, mm -hmm. you know, you have some pretty good receivers. This is another, you know, deep class as far as receivers Absolutely. go. Who? Do, how do you think right now that the top of the receiver um, class stacks up? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, you've got three guys at the top of the class, Marvin Harrison, uh, Roma Dunze from Washington and uh, Malik Neighbors from LSU. Harrison, of course, from Ohio State. And I would put him in that order, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, and then Neighbors. All three of those guys, I think, are game-changing players. Uh, they're guys who I think would start right away at any team they went to, in any situation they went to, and probably have an impact on that team and help that offense get better and probably help guys around them too, help their quarterback. I think that that's the situation when you look at guys like, especially with Odunze and uh, Marvin Harrison, you know, Harrison played for a non-accurate passer last year for the most part, and so did Odunze. I mean, Michael Penix had a great year in terms of downfield stuff, but his, his ball accuracy was not great, and they bailed him out a lot, and they've, they've made guys around them better, and I think that those are guys who we talk about people getting nervous about drafting receivers at the top of the draft. I, I get nervous about it, too, unless it's one of these types of guys, like a Devonta Smith when he went together a couple years ago, Jamar Chase. Those Justin Jefferson would have been one, too, if he had gone up there instant impact type players. And I think a say there, uh, I think is the second one off. And I think he'd be there for the giants. I've looked at him for them an awful lot. And I think he would make a lot of sense. I mean, a guy who would be a quarterback's best friend, you talk about trying to help Daniel Jones, like that's right there. Like get him a guy who can go make a play for him, even if it's a bad ball. And I think that you've got a couple guys up there at the top that can do that for him. Yeah. Dunsey is a guy that I know I like in this draft for the giants mm -hmm. the guy who I still believe is going to be the guy. If he's on the board, of right. course, Nick, what about, you know, offensive linemen? It's been said that this is a deep offensive line class. Dirty. Now, if you're the Giants, you're kind of, you've got a decision to make. You've got all this extra money now in free agency. 
do you maybe in terms of building that offensive line, do you say, okay, look, let's get veterans in here because we really need to hit the ground running with this unit so that we can tell if we have something in Daniel Jones, or do you just say, let's just bring in some more draft assets. I mean, they've been bringing in a lot of draft assets as it is. Yeah. What's the best course of action do you think for this team? Normally it's the draft. I think normally you want to build your offensive line through the draft and especially with the tackles and sort of invest in young, talented tackles so you know can start early. However, when you've taken a quarterback and invested that much into him, it, it complicates things because normally in a situation like that, your quarterback is already stabilized, right? And, the, and that he can handle maybe a tackle getting beat once in a while. In this case, you know, I think that you have a point there and that maybe you've got to be creative and explore uh, free agency in a manner that maybe you wouldn't like to ordinarily in terms of, you know, spending a little bit more on maybe somebody a tackle or maybe a guard even who could come in there and play and then maybe you draft a tackle, whatever it may be. I think the flexibility or the good news is, is there's flexibility from the from the draft standpoint in that, you know, they could address tackle right off the top if they wanted to. You know, a guy like Joe Alt, I think, would be someone who is the type of player when we talk about top tier tackles, he can come in right away. I don't think he would have too much trouble. Uh, he was a pro in college type player, all that sort of stuff. However, they can also wait. And I think this this also speaks to, you know, why they shouldn't, you know, be so quick to jump the gun at quarterback. There's so many other things they could do early and, and they could still get some of the stuff they want later in the draft. We talk about receiver too. I mean, they could take a guy like Odunze right there, or they could also wait. I think there's going to be maybe 20 guys that go off the board in the first two days of the draft this year at, at wide receiver guys who could help, you know, a team. So, there's a lot they could do there, and I think offensive line, tackle, and receiver are two spots where you could get help right away. You could get help on day two. You could wait even get help on day three. So, uh, But the one thing that you mentioned earlier with the tackle spot, I do think you maybe want some experience there in front of a young guy. Nick, in terms of you know the draft, a lot of times media fans have one perception of how the draft stacks up, and obviously the NFL community has another perception. Mm -hmm. Right now, what is the biggest misconception, the biggest disconnect versus, you know, how the NFL community looks at the draft and how the media and fans are looking at it? I think that it, the, the quarter people are kind of catching up on the quarterbacks. I think that's been, you know, the biggest thing that people had thought, you know, there's not going to be that many guys at the top. And then they took them a long time to get there on Jane Daniels. And then now it's taken a while to get there on McCarthy. I think that one is finally sort of settled. But the thing I think that others are starting to catch up on that maybe they haven't quite yet is just truly how deep the receiver tackle. And then I would even say center class. You've got offensive line in general is probably the biggest thing because you've got guys at all three spots, tackle, guard, and center. Receiver is the other top spot. But offensive line is really the one that I think surprises people the most in that we talk every year about how there's a handful of teams that always need a center because it's, you know, it's hard to find the right one and keep the right one for a long time. And, and it's harder because there's not a lot of guys that come up through college that are really ready to go. This year, there's like six or seven that, you know, that could be ready to go. When you talk about offensive tackle, there's six or seven that could go in the first round. So I think that um, there's a lot that could be done in terms of teams that are looking to rebuild their sort of anchor underneath themselves. They're, st they're stable, they're, they're, they're foundation. I think you can do a lot of foundational work on the offensive side of the ball in this draft, not just on day one, but all the way through the whole thing. So there's a lot of good players here. Nick, what about some sleepers in this draft? Who are some, you know, day three gems? You know, last year uh, you had uh, Puka over yeah. at the Rams receiver who, who just surprised a lot of people. Who are some of the – and I'm not just talking receivers. I'm talking right. ball, ball positions. Who are some sleepers that you think are really going to surprise some people in this draft? You know, there's some tight ends, I think, actually, that will. You know, that was another one that I think will surprise people. And we talked about, you know, guys like uh, Theo Johnson from Penn State. I think it's probably going to slip into the top 100. Cade Stover. But a guy that I think is going to be a sleeper on day three or the guy that I would bet on is uh, Tip Ryman from Illinois. Uh, he's 6'5", 270. He's got big, long arms. Uh, ran in the four sixes. Had some great jump numbers. Uh, there's some other tight ends, too. Brevin, Sp uh, Brevin Span Ford from Minnesota. He's almost 6'7", 260. Uh, I think he jumped through the roof as well. There's a lot of tight ends in this class. Tanner McLaughlin from Arizona, who I think not many people – Thought this would be a really good class because I think last year's was so good. It was almost historically good and people maybe overlooked this year's class. I think there's like four or five tight ends in this class. In addition to those centers we just talked about, uh, Bo Limmer, Tanner Bordellini from uh, Wisconsin, that are really just now being kind of discovered by people. And I think those are guys that maybe will be either day three sleepers or slip up into day two even. And tight end, of course, a, a position of need for the Giants, regardless yeah. of what happens with Darren Waller. It's a sneaky need for the Giants, but Always, yeah. certainly a need that they need to address. 
Nick, you know, yesterday was the franchise and transition tag window deadline, and the Giants decided not to tag Saquon Barkley. They decided not to do a tag with uh, Xavier McKinney, mm-hmm. arguably their top two pending free agents. Were you surprised with that decision? Um, a little bit on McKinney, right? I, I don't know, and I think I, I heard Sean at the Combine talk about Saquon, and he sounded – as optimistic as you can sound in public about you trying to work something out with him. They did say the franchise tag was an option, but it almost sounded like to me just standing there, it almost sounded like the franchise tag was an option if they didn't think they would be able to get anything done. So in some ways I wonder if maybe that means that they do think they can get something done with Saquon long-term. And then with McKinney, that is a little bit of a weird one because I'm not sure what the plan is. I do wonder though, like we've talked about here, there's a lot that they need to address. And there's a lot that has to get fixed on this team. And, you know, Maybe they're trying to be flexible with the money, and maybe they're trying to look at, hey, we, we might have to be more aggressive in free agency with the offensive line than we wanted to because, like we just said, if we're trying to get a quarterback back healthy again and back confident, you know, do we really want all rookies up there? You know, I, so I, I do wonder what I thought when I saw that. It was initially sort of like, I don't know, I don't get that. So like you said, he's, if not their best defensive player, one of their best players. I think he was a captain and everything else. It seems like they want to keep him. But I do wonder, you know, maybe they're trying to be flexible with money, uh, you know, because they do have a lot of stuff they have to look at. So, but that could also be another one too, where, like I said, with Saquon, maybe they're on their way to have to a deal. I mean, maybe that's something where they finally figured this thing out and then get it done. I mean, hopefully, for the Giants' sake, they can at least get Saquon done. I mean, that's one that seems like it needs to get figured out here because, yeah, I mean, they talk about his value. His value is that he's their best player. I feel like, and he needs to be paid accordingly. So, hopefully, that gets done at some point. Hey, Giant fans, say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if their first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, you name it. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Stick with Saquon for a moment here because yeah. he, he is has been their most productive player when healthy. At that when end. healthy, yes, right. Um, so that being said, you know, I think a lot of teams start to see running backs kind of slow down a little bit once they reach a certain age. I think 27 was the age that was mentioned, mm-hmm. which is what Saquon is. But but still, you know, given the state of the Giants offense and where they are, if they were to lose Saquon, how mm-hmm. much do you think that would hurt Daniel Jones in, in his attempt to prove that he's still the guy? It would hurt a lot because the way that, you know, when they drafted him, and I know it's not everyone who drafted him then is not here now and all this, but when they drafted him, the team was sort of built around him in a way that, you know, run game and he would be featured. And, you know, and that means that sometimes you're taking less of a chance or whatever, you're less depth at certain spots or maybe less playmakers on the outside. And I just feel like if if he's not there, you don't have a reasonable, reasonable replacement for him. And additionally, you don't have enough weapons everywhere else to sort of replace what you're losing for him. It'd be one thing if, you know, they lost Saquon and then immediately took that money and went and signed a big time, tight end or something or a receiver and then went and drafted a Dunze and then another guy or something like that, you know, and found offensive line help on it in addition to, I just feel like Saquon's a guy who can help your run game and your pass game all at once. And that's the sort of thing. That's the way I think they want to play. I don't think they want to be this like super up tempo team that throws the ball a thousand times. I think they want to control the game through the, through the ground, uh, make smart decisions with the ball through the air, play a little bit like the lions do in some, in some cases, and let Saquon be the star star of the show. And I think that if he's not there, it makes everything kind of go back to start, in my opinion. So if you're losing Saquon, you might as well be starting over in so, in so many ways. And that's why it sort of made it odd that they paid Daniel Jones right before him, so I guess. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's football. That's how it works sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to ask you, do you think if the Giants were to land a, a, you know, a Roma Dunze and, and really build up – the receiving yeah. core, because ultimately I think they want to be a vertical offense. They want to be able to throw and be explosive. Mm-hmm. So does that maybe t- shift some of the focus away from having, you know, the running aspect of, of Saquon? And I know you still need to have a running game, but th- right. does it maybe say, t- you know, that, oh, okay, as long as we get a guy who can move the pile and, you know, be functional yeah. out of the backfield, we can maybe get away with it. 
I think that that's fair. And I think that what it does, if you address it now, high in the draft, is it, you know, ideally, I think for the Giants is they can get Saquon signed for a couple of years and get him, get him as much money as he wants paid here for a couple of years. And then by the time he's 30, you know, you're moving on. Ideally, I think that you feel like that might be the thing. So if you get a young guy in here now who's a good pass catcher or a guy on the outside or a couple guys, you can start transitioning toward that. I feel like growing with Daniel Jones, getting young receivers along with a young quarterback so they can build trust and they can build the timing and all that sort of thing is super important. And then, yes, I mean, at some point you have to be uh, cognizant. That's part of the Saquon conversation is you can't sign him for 10 years. You can't sign him for seven. You know, it's not going to happen. It's not like a quarterback. So you have to be, you want to take care of his window while it's here and get the most out of it, but you also have to be cognizant of what happens after that. So, um, yeah, I feel like they need to address receiver and the playmaker area of their team in the draft, probably early uh, and maybe often, I would say, maybe more than once. Because they don't, they have a few picks. They have It's not like they're shy on picks this year. So I wouldn't be afraid to maybe do it twice if I were them. All right, now with McKinney, a little different situation. You got a 24-year-old safety who can play all over the place. Last year, he played every defensive snap, right. started the year off slowly, but came on like, you know, a, a, a like a, a hurricane, if you will, um, towards the end there. You know, they're running a risk of him leaving. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, they have Dane Belton, who they drafted, I think, a couple years ago. Jason Pinnock has played well. I think he's been underrated. But still, you look at the risk that the Giants are taking with McKinney, is this something that you think could potentially blow up in their face if McKinney leaves? Yeah, definitely if he leaves. I mean, if it, I don't know all their plans here, what they've got going on behind, but I mean, if he if he goes, I don't understand letting him go for not you know because you know he is a twenty four year old player, like you said, and the safety market's tricky. I know that, and it's it's going to change, and it is changing now because the position has been. I feel like the position has been underpaid for so long because its value is so high because you have a lot of guys. Not a lot of guys, but you have some like a McKinney who can play multiple spots. They can line up a corner, they can line up in the slot, they can play deep, they can play in the box and fit the run. And those are guys that allow these defenses to just live in nickel and dime and not have to worry about, you know, playing so many big guys and all that sort of thing. So they have to get paid. And it's one of these things where the market for it has been has been changing and adjusting because there's so many different types. And McKinney is a, 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 a like a hybrid tweener. He's like all over the place, right? So I feel like there's probably some trickiness in terms of what he wants and what they think he's worth right now, because it's only really been one year. So I don't know. That is tricky when you get a young player like that, though, that automatically just calls you on it like right away and says, I want that, you know, so I don't know. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but like, it, yes, it is a risk because if you lose a guy like that and you're not willing to, you know, do what you got to do to keep him, that's something that uh, is going to haunt you for a while, I would think. All right, let me throw this stat out at you. You had the Bears, the Broncos, the Cardinals, the Chargers, the Vikings, the Falcons, the Seahawks, all had the highest paid safeties in the NFL in 2023. All those teams did not make the postseason. So if yeah. you're a general manager and you're saying to yourself, okay, how am I going to allocate my money? Does it still make sense to devote Right. To to you know a, a large chunk of change to a Xavier McKinney. I mean, safeties have have obviously you know grown. The position has mm -hmm. grown in terms of value, but in terms of top dollar value, is it still a case of left tackle, cornerback, you know, uh, edge rusher? I mean, or, or or do you think that you know last year was kind of a um, an outlier, if you will? It could be an outlier, and I think that that's a fair thing for them to have hesitation on in that, you know, let, let's not be careless and just give a guy a giant contract based off of one year and get into a Kenny Galladay, you know, type situation, and that's what sort of happened with him. You know, you don't want to do that, and I totally understand that part of it, but the Giants are in a unique situation here where you also don't want to just be letting good players lead your building, and, you know, uh, that especially young ones, because they're still trying to establish a culture under Brian Dable and all this, and they're still trying to establish – what they're about, and you're trying to win games at the at the end of the day. And I think that if you keep on, you know, if you continue to worry about how you're allocating your money while you're watching good players walk out the door, well, who, uh, well, who are you even spending this money on? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, at some point, it has to go somewhere. So I, it, that is a tricky one. The safeties, that's why it was a little surprising, but then you think about it and you're like, well, that's a tricky spot because maybe they need more time to think about it. Maybe they're kind of calling his bluff, right? And and the mark, maybe the market – didn't respond to him the way that you know, he thought it would, or I don't know all the details on that, but um, it's tricky from the standpoint of they are in that really hard spot for, for a 
younger coach who's trying to get his feet wet and it, a couple more losses, it's going to go the other way. You're not going to get it back, right? You can't have another really bad skid here. You've got to be able to turn this thing around now, get some talented players on the field and go win some games. And, you know, worrying about the long, long term and while you're sort of current guy is we need help right now is sort of, you know, it's a tricky line that they've got to walk, but that's one that they've got to figure out. Final question for you, Nick, you know, I don't think Joe Shane and Brian Dable are in trouble this coming year, regardless of what happens. I think, you know, John Mara, the co one of the co-owners is going to be patient. He's got to be patient because you can't mm -hmm. just keep turning stuff around. Right. But that said, you know, just to go back to the quarterback situation, there is a school of thought that if you're going to go down with the ship, you want to go down with the guy that you pick, not the mm -hmm. guy you inherited. But that said, do you think it makes sense for the Giants to just, you know, say, all right, you know what? We're going to go down with the ship with, with Daniel Jones, regardless, we'll, we'll draft the guy and we'll develop him. But Daniel Jones, you know, if he is healthy, he's our guy all next year. Let the kid, you know, uh, that we draft sit and, and, you know, we'll see where we're at at the end of the year. No, I wouldn't do that. I would say, Daniel Jones, this is your job until proven otherwise. And you've got to, you know, you're the starting quarterback, but this kid's going to come in here with all, you know, if you check, if you take Bo Nix or, you know, one of these guys that we talked about, we're bringing him in here and we're going to give him number two reps. He's going to push you. He's going to push you in camp and we're going to give him starters reps in camp. And we're going to do all the stuff that we would normally do with a veteran there. And he's going to be right there. And the media is going to talk to him and they're going to be there. And it's going to be pressure that you're going to have to deal with because I want you to deal with that. I, I'm not, I don't like the, the whole thing about babying these guys to a point of you, you, you need to see if they can handle sort of that adversity and creating a, and it's not babying, but like creating an environment where he doesn't have to worry about who's behind him or look over his shoulder. That's not realistic. That's not football. That's not how it works at any other position in the league on the field. Right. So especially for a guy who hasn't really done anything yet. And I think that uh, he has to earn it. And if I were them, I would, want a backup quarterback behind him that I sort of trusted that I, that I thought, Hey, if things do go bad, we need to be able to not just make a hollow threat here with him. So yeah, I think that that's where they're at with Daniel Jones. And I think that needs to happen this year. It's also where they need to be with Evan Neal. You mentioned not being yeah, a guy yeah. or not handing a job. Evan Neal is another one who totally. I think falls into, into that category as well. Yeah, totally. It's the same exact thing. You've got to find guys in the draft that can come in here and just light a fire under your young, your young veterans almost, right? Because we talk about these guys like they're old and they're not old. They're like 25 or 24 or 26. And sometimes the guys at the end of that rookie deal, they just need a little bit of a spark from the younger guy underneath them. And then they turn into the guy that you thought you drafted. It happens. It happens a lot actually. So rather than just giving up and cutting bait on everybody, I feel like they're in a spot where they do have some young talent that could surprise them but it needs to be pushed and it needs to be pushed through young competitive players in the draft. And I think they're in a good spot to do that, um, but they've got to be careful. They've got to make it make uh, every pick count. I agree. Definitely. Nick, thank you so much for Absolutely. the excellent insight. I appreciate you coming on. He is Nick Baumgartner. He is a senior writer with the, uh, senior writer and NFL draft analyst with The Athletic. Make sure you check out The Athletic. They're always running special deals if you want to get their coverage. It's really good. I recommend it. Dane Brugler has his beast coming out. Yeah. If it's not out already. Couple which weeks. Is, well, no. is it out already? Not know? yet. Couple weeks. Couple weeks. It's coming. Couple, yeah, all that's, right. that's that's a must read <laughs> for draft that, for draft Knicks. So anyway, Giant fans, thank you so much for joining me here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Be sure you keep it here all week long. We'll have plenty of new content as we get into the start of free agency. It's going to be a fun and wild ride. For Nick Baumgartner, I'm Patricia Trainer. Thank you, Giant fans, for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.